I took my clonidine patch off because when I woke up from surgery, I still had it on and my blood pressure hit 115 over 70. They were like, no, take that off. Now they don't have me on anything. And since they don't have me on anything, it'll get too high. And when it gets too high, if it hits 160 over 100, I have to take clonidine, like the pill form. And the pill form knocks me out. <laughs> so I'll take it. And I'm like, I'm going to go lay down now, take a nap. <laughs> Oh, you look wonderful. Yes. <laughs> and the doctor's like, good, you should be napping at this time. <laughs> Hi, Cordis. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can everybody hear me? I can hear you. Yes. And I can hear you guys and see you guys. Okay, I'm relieved. Right. I know, right? <laughs> That's perfect. And and you guys know each other from before? I think this is the first time I've met anybody from this panel. Well, I'll introduce myself. Uh, guys, so my name is Maria uh, Bermudez. I'm a nephrologist. I work at Geisinger Medical Center. It's located in Danville, central Pennsylvania. And, and yeah, I'm a home dialysis passionate and provider. So it's such a pleasure to meet you all. Is my I'm Trisha Patterson. And I work in Denver with Davida with PD. I've only done PD uh, about a, since 2011. Hi, I'm Curtis Warfield from Indianapolis, Indiana. A uh, former PD patient was transplanted back in uh, 2016 by a living donor and uh, also on the board of Home Dialysis United and uh, advocate for other kidney organizations uh, since that time. So happy to meet everybody. Uh, my name is Katie. I am the young patient, I guess. I'm 21. Um, I was on PD from December of 2021 to, well, August 17th of this year, because I just got my first transplant. Uh, also living donor of a girl my age, my size, and my weight percentile. So it's kind of weird. She's a complete stranger, and she was a 97% tissue match to me. Um, so, yeah, she actually met me because I work for NPR. I'm a, I'm a radio host for NPR. I'm the All Things Considered host for Oklahoma City. And we have, like, a social media account, and they were doing, like, a meet the host thing. And I guess I said something funny, and she followed me because of that and saw on my profile where I had made this joke about needing spare parts and she's studying to become a nurse. And she said that she had actually served on the pediatric dialysis unit. And so she wanted to go through the process of donating me. And I didn't take her seriously at first because she's a complete stranger. <laughs> um, and I said, okay, <laughs> like, all right. And then she ended up being my match and I tried to talk her out of it. Cause I was like, listen, I have IgA nephropathy. Like there's always the chance that that transplant will be killed off by my disease. You really don't have to do this. But she was insistent up until the end and we went through it and yeah, it actually ended up working out because she, she was part of the foster care system and my parents have applied to adopt her like post her as being an adult. So she'll spend all of her holidays with us from now on. Um, oh, yeah. A lifelong connection. Yes. Yeah. I always joke. I'm like, we're the same person, but so different at the same time. <laughs> um, I'm like, now you're part of me <laughs> forever. <laughs> yeah. I'm also a living donor and I have a connection to the patient yes. that I needed to. It's so surprising. I would tell people because I mean, on dialysis, I, the only, the only thing that really gave away that I was on dialysis was I was always very underweight. Um, even on PD, I went from 110 pounds to about I think 82 when I first went into kidney failure. I'm at 86 right now because at first, I'm not sure. I think it was the myfortic that was doing it to me um, and probably all the antibiotics they had me on. I was having stomach issues because uh, I didn't eat a lot on dialysis because I just didn't have an appetite. And then the prednisone, of course, made me hungry. So then I was trying to like eat and my body wasn't having it. So I was throwing everything up. So I ended up losing a bunch of weight. And um, so I'm at 86 right now, but we're getting up there. <laughs> It was kind of funny. The transplant center was like, listen, we're going to tell you this as a young woman, but a lot of times our, our female patients gain a lot of weight after transplantation and that's okay. And then I stepped up on the scale and it was like 39.7 kilograms. And they all kind of like looked at me. <laughs> they said, maybe the batteries need to be changed. I said, no, I think that's the right weight. 
that was really the only indicator mm -hmm. that I was sick or something. So I was so like little, I had like a BMI of 15 and I would tell people, I go, Oh yeah, I'm in kidney failure. And they'd say, Oh, I'll donate to you. I'm like you don't even know me. <laughs> I can be a bad person. Handing <laughs> like, out there. Handing out your organs like that. <laughs> Oh my true, true. Well, Katie, uh, don't worry. A uh, similar instance, actually, uh, living, I got my kidney from a living donor that was my daughter's sorority sister. So I saw that. I was looking I know, for that I mean, and I was like, that's insane. Uh huh. What sorority was it? I'm, I go to OU, the University of Oklahoma. So oh. Greek life is huge out here. <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard. Uh, she's part of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority okay we don't have that one we have honestly i'm not part of greek life so i don't know um <laughs> here in oklahoma you have to look a certain way to be part of greek life uh -huh. and my dad my dad's full-blood native american english was not my first language growing up so i didn't fit the demographic <laughs> they were looking for here in okay um but we have alpha gamma delta i think is what they're called agd okay. and uh -huh. we have, yeah that's about all i know about them um mm -hmm. The, there, they, there's a sorority house right behind the radio station. So whenever I'm like on air or something, sometimes you can hear them doing their like chants, you know? Yeah. And I'm always like, man, I'm going to go out there and join them. <laughs> Just empowering. <laughs> Maria, where are you from? Where am I from? It's originally from Colombia. Yeah. Colombia. Okay. I'm actually dating a man from Venezuela. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. you guys are neighbors. Yes, yes, they are. Yeah, I, I did my medical school there uh, and then came to to do my residency in 2005 uh, mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. Yeah, then okay. I went to New York to study nephrology and, and then came back to Pennsylvania. So I've been here for, goodness, over 15 years. Whoa. Yeah. We're in a cold part of America, too. I'm Like I said, I'm from Oklahoma. It's It gets really cold out here in the winter. It, it gets yeah. regularly below zero degrees out here. Um, but this summer has been really brutal for us. It was like 115, but mm -hmm. when, it got, when it got that hot, I didn't even feel it because I was in the hospital and they had me drugged up and I was like, what are you guys talking about? We have a heat wave going on right now. <laughs> what? It, yeah, it was pretty nice here, actually. It wasn't as, as bad. Interesting. And Trisha, you said you work for Davida? Yes. That's, that's the machine. I have the Baxter machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the center that I did. I'm actually supposed to make an appointment to return my, my PD machine. Yes, you need to do that. I know. This is, my, so my, my center is, um, my center has like my personal phone number because they used to call me their little golden child. Because out where I live, I live on a reservation and there's a ton of people in kidney failure out here from diabetes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was their only, I was their only patient below the age of 25 that was not diabetic. Um, and so they used to call me my, their little, what did they call me? They called me their little golden child or something like that. They'd be like, oh, there's our girl. So they're mm -hmm. all on my personal phone number. And I've been getting text messages like, hey, that's your reminder. And I was like, yeah, but what if I have like a rejection episode? They were like, Katie, you're 21 and you have a living donor. You're fine. I was like, mm -hmm. okay. Same. <laughs> no, I, could, I couldn't wait. They were like, no, everything's working. You can call the dialysis center and give back your... I heard call dialysis center. I was already on the phone. Well, it's like, I'm, like, I'm the type of person that doctors hate me because I will research everything. And they're, they're like, they're like, we're prescribing you a Torx net. And I'm like, oh yeah, because my cholesterol is high. And they're like, yes, your cholesterol is high. So I'm like, I was telling them, I was like, well, the risk of rejection is really high in the first three months. And like, my bladder stint is causing me to bleed. And like, what if I get an infection? They're like, you're fine. You're okay. Like, just give it back to us. <laughs> <You're> just concerned. <laughs> I keep checking on my cat. I'm afraid she's going to start meowing because she starts doing that when she wakes up. <laughs>
Is this one beginning at two o'clock? Mm -hmm. Well, it's three for you guys, right? Three for us. Mm -hmm. One for me. Oh. Ah. <laughs> Why yes. for you? I know my my outlook will be like starting in five minutes. I'm like, what? What? And then I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> so we can. So I hear they're currently running a little over on the main stage. So we'll wait a little bit to have people join us. I know, I was like, is there a moderator for this session? Is it just us, just freestyling? <laughs> That's been funny. Curtis, how's your transplant doing? That's more than four years out, whoa. Yeah, seven and a half, so, is, so yeah. far. Well, I started I started high school in 2016, so I had to think about how long it's been. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but things have been going really well. Uh, no complications or anything. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to behave. There have been a couple of times I've kind of slid off as far <laughs> as diet and stuff concerns, but for the oh, most yeah. part, things are going good. That's good. I was so sick upon waking up. The first two weeks, I, I was like, you guys lied to me. I was like, you guys said I feel good. I felt good on dialysis, and now I feel like I've been hit by a bus. And then I think three days ago, I stopped throwing everything I was eating up, like just spontaneously. I guess I guess my body decided to act right. Okay. And ever since then, I'm like, okay, this is good. <laughs> I was like, you know what? I just actually, I'm kicking, all right. That's great. I think we're having some people joining us. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're going to give a few more minutes before we start to get more people to join us. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third uh, breakout session of our second annual dialysis, Home Dialysis Event 2023. On behalf of Home Dialyzers United and American Kidney Fund, we're thrilled to have you join our session, A Path to Independence with Peritoneal Dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis is a type of home dialysis that is friendly to use, provides patients with more flexibility, lifestyle advantages, including fulfillment of study, business, social commitments, 
can be suitable for very young and also elderly patients. And as more frequent therapy, as it is simulating what our kidneys do for us, uh, in comparison to in-center dialysis, peritoneal dialysis have fewer, has fewer restrictions in terms of uh, fluid and food intake. And it also can be associated with improved health outcomes, including a more steady control of our blood pressure and also our fluid balance. This breakout session is specifically for individuals that have decided that peritoneal dialysis is the best option for them, and also those who are still undecided and are considering peritoneal dialysis as their treatment path. During our session, we will be discussing the lifestyle and health benefits of peritoneal dialysis. We will be assessing its fit for specific points in an individual's dialysis journey and guiding attendees through important considerations regarding this treatment path. Our goals are to help you discover how peritoneal dialysis can enhance one's lifestyle, particularly in regard to autonomy, flexibility, and time management. And we also wanna help you gain insights into common challenges patients may face while managing peritoneal dialysis and at, at the same time, help you find potential solutions. Without further ado, let's get started with some brief introductions. I'll give you a little background about myself. My name is Maria Camila Bermudez. I'm a nephrologist. I'm a home dialysis advocate and pas passionate. I am the director of our home dialysis program at my institution, Geisinger Medical Center, located in Danville, Pennsylvania. I'm also an educator. I serve as the associate program director of our fellowship program. And I basically commit all my time to empowering and encouraging patients, care partners, and healthcare providers of all levels of training to promote um, home therapies. I'm happy to be joined today by three amazing, uh, wonderful human beings, mm -hmm. two patient advocates and a great home PD expert nurse that are gonna be sharing with us their personal experience on peritoneal dialysis. Let me first introduce Katie. Uh, Katie Hallam, welcome. Uh, Katie was on peritoneal dialysis for over a year and a half before she received the gift of life. Uh, she received a living donor recently, about a month ago, on August 17th. Uh, congratulations, Katie, we're very happy for you. Thank you. Um, she's 20 years old, she's highly accomplished. Uh, she attends school as a journalism and international security double major. And she currently works as a journalist for NPR and has plans to attend law school. Our second panelist is Curtis Warfield, uh, who was diagnosed with stage three chronic kidney disease in 2012 due to uh, FSGS or focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. sclerosis. Two years later in December, 2014, he started peritoneal dialysis. When his daughter was deemed unsuitable to be a living donor, her college sorority sister stepped forward and donated one of her kidneys just because she wanted to help. Since receiving his kidney in January 2016, Curtis has become a passionate advocate in organizations and on Capitol Hill about kidney disease, dialysis, organ donation, and living donors. And providers, he provides peer counseling for kidney disease and post-transplant patients and their families. He also serves as a home dialyzer's board of directors member. Welcome, Curtis. A very honored to have you with us. Last but not least, we have nurse Patricia Patterson. Patricia is an experienced peritoneal dialysis nurse. She works with Davida. She's highly published. She's published articles in the Nephrology Nursing Journal on home hemodialysis and access issues, and was also an author for the peritoneal dialysis chapter in the current sixth edition of the Contemporary Nephrology Nursing Textbook. Yeah. We're grateful to have all of you with us. We will answer all of your questions in the audience in the last 15 minutes of our session. So you're more than welcome to type your comments uh, or questions in the little chat window. We will do our best to answer all questions. So let's get started with our session. Um, I'd like to start with a question for our patients. We can start with Katie. Katie, what, why was peritoneal dialysis the right choice for you? 
So I was actually at a kind of an extenuating circumstance where I was unconscious in the intensive care unit when I went into kidney failure. And my nephrologist had been with me since the beginning of my kidney disease diagnosis. I was diagnosed with IgA nephropathy when I was 18. And he made the decision for me to uh, start me on peritoneal dialysis because he knew um, he knew me very personally and knew that I would not want to sit in a center and I would not I would not want to give up my college um, experience to sit in a center. And he also made the decision based on the fact that I had no other health issues and my heart was in perfect condition and he didn't want to jeopardize anything for my future. And so he talked to my parents about it. And they signed the consent forms for the operation to be done. And that is why I ended up doing PD dialysis. And I'm so grateful to him to this day for not even entertaining anything else, because he truly was the reason that I am graduating on time. I am continuing to go to school. And honestly, I think I was home for maybe a month when I was just adjusting to um, life on dialysis. And then by the time I had been doing treatment for about three weeks, I moved back up to my college town and was doing it by myself in my apartment. Um, so I really, really do appreciate him for that. Okay, that, that's very inspiring and extremely helpful uh, to learn how you were able to continue with life and just adjust dialysis to your life and not the other way around. So mm -hmm. Cody, uh, how about you? Why, why was peritoneal dialysis the right choice for you? You might share with well, um, my story is almost completely uh, opposite. Uh, my nephrologist at the time was very much uh, guiding me towards hemodi in center hemodialysis. And uh, when it came time to uh, try the uh, fistula uh, implants or fistula uh, surgery, uh, the first time uh, Unfortunately, my veins closed off about a week after the surgery. Uh, they were like, uh, let's try it again. So about a couple of months later, they went in and tried it. And uh, my veins actually closed up uh, during recovery. So as they were uh, looking at uh, either going for my other arm or another place, uh, looking at actually my legs, uh, I brought up the question, was there something else? Because one, hospital costs were starting to run up uh, due to these surgeries. Uh, and two, uh, uh, it was kind of like, okay, you're starting to cut a little bit more on my body than what I would like. So it was then at the time I was uh, told about peritoneal dialysis and upon doing some research on that, seeing how much more uh, really freedom that I would have as far as my lifestyle, uh, it really wouldn't uh, affect my work. I still was working full time, still kind of the main uh, uh, supplier for our family. And, uh, you know, just looking at that freedom and not having to do with needles. Uh, not that I'm scared of needles, but having to do uh, hemodialysis three times a week, uh, I really wasn't looking forward to doing that. So uh, uh, being clear to uh, uh, do uh, peritoneal dialysis, uh, everything worked out well. And I was able, uh, as I said, to be able to continue to work full time and still do a lot of the activities that I was normally used to doing. That's great, Cody. Thank you so much. I think you you mentioned something that is very common, and, and I, I wanted to to reinforce, uh, and that is that is actually quite common that some patients may be geared towards one type of dialysis. Uh, in this case, in center dialysis, and how important it is for patients to be their own advocates to to make sure we're looking for all the options and to consider even second opinions uh, for for the different types of paths that, that might be uh, playing a, a role in your particular time of your, of your life. Um, so with these, let me switch gears to, to Nurse Patterson, Patricia. Uh, in your experience, in your practice, who do you typically find as good candidates for peritoneal dialysis? Uh, how are potential peritoneal dialysis identified? 
We really do try to do modality education for all patients and um, the doctors who work in our area will send patients to talk to us while they're still CKD4 um, so that they can see the equipment and we get to talk to them about what their home is like and show them how long the line is and that has to run from into the bathroom for the drainage. And it just really helps them to actually see the material and talk to us about how long the dialysis will be and uh, where the catheter is going to be in their body. And that really is very persuasive for a lot of people. And they say, oh, I, this is manageable. I can do this. And some people say, oh, no, that's not what I want at all. So we really like to see people before they have uh, kidney failure to be able to hands-on make a good decision on what's going to work for their life. Thank you, Patricia. That, that's exactly my experience. I'll, I'll, I'll also like to add uh, there's different tools that can help uh, providers, nurses, physicians to help identify if peritoneal dialysis is right for you. For example, there's a questionnaire. It's called MatchD. It mm -hmm. helps providers determine uh, if there's any potential barriers that either could be overcome or could be contraindications for peritoneal dialysis. That's a helpful tool that you might be um, aware of if you are at an in-center dialysis unit. But the idea is to really look at all aspects that are necessary for peritoneal dialysis, starting from the house, the home, make sure the home is suitable, that is clean, that it has enough space. Uh, if barriers are identified in that arena, there are things we can do to try to overcome those barriers. So again, I mentioned the second opinion, but try to, you know, if you're enthusiastic about peritoneal dialysis, there's a lot of things that can be done to, to make sure potential barriers are overcome. Another important um, aspect is the membrane. So, you know, as providers, we want to make sure your peritoneal membrane, which is going to be your kidney, is going to be what's going to be filtering and cleaning your blood. We want to make sure that membrane is healthy. If you had a lot of surgeries in the abdomen before, that may or may not be a problem. So I always encourage my patients not to take a no for an answer quickly. Surgeons may be able to assess this objectively before you are deemed a non-candidate for peritoneal dialysis. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those are very big things. Um, a common misconception is that patients that are overweight cannot do peritoneal dialysis. That is not totally true. Uh, if a patient has a lot of urine, yet what we call residual kidney function, and they make still a lot of urine, even patients that are a little overweight or overweight may do very well on peritoneal dialysis. So, so I guess my point is there might be barriers that might be identified um, and candidacy is going to depend on each one of you and, and hopefully a very enthusiastic team that is going to help overcome potential barriers. All right, so our third question um, is going to be for all of us. So we can start with Katie. Uh, Katie, compared to other modalities, I know you, you're not experienced with in-center dialysis or home hemodialysis, but how, how do you think peritoneal dialysis enhanced your sense of independence? How, how do you think that played a role in your independence? Yeah, so um, I started dialysis my sophomore year of college. Um, and I always say I'm the poster lame person in college because I don't drink and I don't do drugs. And that was not because of kidney failure. That's just because I like to have my wits about me. Um, I do like going out late at night, though. Um, you know, just getting McDonald's or going into the city because I grew up on a reservation. So I didn't really have a lot of stuff other than a dollar general around me growing up. So living in a major metropolitan city was new for me. And I didn't really have any early morning classes. And I did one of the lowest forms of treatment possible because I did not retain fluid. Um, and I was very underweight otherwise. And so I would come back home at may, back to my apartment at maybe three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. And I would have already set up my dialysis machine before I left. And then I would connect and I'd go to sleep and I would be done by usually 10. And then my classes started at one. So I was basically able to set up when I wanted to connect when I wanted to. 
I had the complete freedom of whatever time, just as long as it got done. And I never missed a treatment. Uh -oh. um, and since I was on such a low form, I a very liberal diet. Um, I was even able to drink dark soda if I wanted to, just as long as it wasn't an excessive amount. Um, but it really, I always say, cause people, people used to tell me, they say, uh, they'd say, you must feel so awful because kidney disease took away the first like formative years of your adult life. And I was, I always shook my head and I said, no, it, it really didn't. I was gone from school for maybe a month while I recovered from my intensive care unit stay. I had a seizure because my blood pressure hit like 280 over 170. Um, <laughs> that's what happened to me. Um, but once I'd recovered from that ICU stay, it was like it was just a little blip. And I went back. I I rejoined the roller derby team, the figure skating team. It was like nothing had happened to me. Um, so I'm very grateful for PD dialysis because I always say I'm a very independent person. And I quite literally thought it was a death sentence because uh, I, I like I said, I'm a double major. I'm an international security studies double major and I want to work in the foreign service. And I thought that I wouldn't be able to travel anymore. But. I went to Washington. I I almost went to Germany with my dialysis machine, but then they told me I was getting a transplant. So that trip is for next year. <laughs> but yeah, I was I, I had quite a bit of freedom on dialysis. That's wonderful, Katie. And Curtis, how about you? How how did peritoneal dialysis play a role in your sense of independence and autonomy? Well, Katie said it best. You know, it, it allows that freedom. Uh, to be able to schedule your treatments when you wanted to. Uh, for me, I was able to schedule those at night so I could still keep doing things during the day. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, continuing to work uh, and work full time at my job uh, and uh, not having to really uh, you know, worry about those two, three or four times a week, depending on the treatment of end center uh, dialysis and also uh, being able to keep my family in a mode to where as it was less worrisome on them. So no one had to either take me uh, to the clinic or be on call if I drove myself and uh, wasn't feeling well and had to be picked up or anything like that. So uh, it's the, the freedom of, of doing that and again, not having to deal with uh, the needles and stuff. That's great. Patricia, anything to add from your experience as a nurse, maybe comparing with other modalities? Um, I like that we were able to make the PD adjusted for the person's personal life. And so we had a person who was a truck driver and was gonna be in different places and we made it portable for him so that he could do a CAPD exchange um, in the middle of the day if he needed to. I had one patient who wanted to sleep with his dog and so he didn't want to do the dialysis at night. So he did the manual bags during the day. So there's more options. You don't have to do it all night. There are other options for the daytime. Um, so the biggest problem would be if the person isn't making urine anymore. That is when they have to do dialysis all day and all night. Mm. But you know, there's a lot of independence in different ways that PD can be can fit into your lifestyle. That's great, Patricia. I was going to share similar uh, experiences. You know, where, where I work, uh, Central Pennsylvania is rural. Uh, we have a lot of farmers. Uh, I had patients that did not want anything to do with the side care. Electricity wasn't very reliable, and they have been able to continue to work. Um, you know, continue to live life and and thrive. Uh, so that's actually quite helpful for quality of life. And, and you know, it has been uh, flexible and, and great for them. So now let, let me ask Katie and uh, Curtis, uh, how did you adjust your lifestyle to accommodate to your PD treatments? Were there any things you needed to change in order to, to adjust to PD? Um, for me, there wasn't a lot of, uh, lot of change um uh, like i said i did my uh, uh exchanges or exchange uh during the evening so the biggest thing was uh getting home at a reasonable time uh especially during the week uh to be able to hook up to the machine 
Um, my diet changed a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, I did uh, restrict my salt intake uh, a lot more as well as my uh, uh, looking out for different uh, sugars and things like that. But uh, for the most part, uh, things didn't really uh, change a lot. You know, uh, I did keep to a certain type of schedule to where I knew I was going to eat during a certain time period and, of course, uh, do the uh, uh, dialysis at night. But outside of that, I was pretty good. I Pretty similar with me. Um, really, the only issue I had was when it came to eating, I ended up completely losing my appetite and not in a way of food was gross to me. It was more, I just didn't feel the need to eat. Um, I would go, I would wake up and it maybe hit 7 PM during the day and I'd realize I hadn't eaten at all. And I never felt sick from that. Um, a lot of it was, they said a lot of it was the glucose solution was just making me feel full. Um, but I knew that I needed to eat. And the problem was, was I've always been a really small person. So I was about 90 pounds on dialysis. And as a result, my stomach shrunk a little bit. And so if I tried to eat, I would get really sick. So I had to make sure to not eat at a certain hour of the night if I knew I was going to connect soon afterwards, because the fluid pushing down on my stomach would make me very sick during the night. Um, but that was pretty much it. Uh, other than that, I mean, there was always the whole if somebody called me in the middle of the night needing me to pick him up, I'd say, I'm sorry, I'm connected to my, my, my machine. But a lot of times that got me out of situations of having to go get someone at six o'clock in the morning from God knows where in Oklahoma City. So <laughs> maybe that was a blessing in disguise. <laughs> but kind of similar, I knew that even if, it, if even if I did mosey in in my apartment at 4 a.m., I'd be like, oh, I've still got to connect. <laughs> um, but like I said, it really wasn't that bad of a lifestyle change. That's great. And, and I hear a lot from my patients what you were describing about feeling full or that sense of early society, uh, you know, in part is because of that fluid that is going to be in the abdomen. But, but there's a lot of strategies to overcome that. Um, you can have a fractionated diet. So as opposed to having, you know, large meals, we recommend you're going to be eating more frequently, but smaller meals. You can also adjust with your team, with your uh, nephrologist and your nurse, the amount of fluid, the frequency, time, your treatment. So you have your main meal when you're empty. So there's really a lot of things you can work with your team to make sure you're enjoying everything of life, including food. That is so important. So, so now let me ask uh, Patricia, what are the most important things to be on the lookout uh, when, when someone is going to be doing peritoneal dialysis? A uh, question is, geared towards how to prevent infection, for example. Uh, what things would you share with patients that are very important? Um, well, in terms of making adjustments in their life, they do need to make sure that they come to the clinic twice a month. After the initial training, they come twice a month. We're going to do labs once a month and we'll do some review education and discuss how things are going at home. And then the second time is for a a day with the doctor, dietitian, social worker, and the nurse. And so there is a whole team working together and you don't want to miss those appointments. And so most people can use FMLA to make sure that they can get time off of work to attend those two meetings a month. Um, and then the other point of your question is, what do they have to be aware of? We want to keep the treatment area, which is usually your bedroom, clean and neat. There's a lot of supplies, so you're going to need space to put the boxes of dialysate solution. You're going to need to be organized. You know, there's you have to have supplies to clean your exit site and to clean the catheter and the, um, you know, the masks, gloves. I mean, there's just so much equipment. So we encourage people to plan ahead and make a space and have bins or baskets or drawers or something to keep everything handy so that you can do your connection without having to touch anything. You want to keep your hands clean after you wash them um, and so that you're very conscientious when you're doing your connection. You'll be wearing a mask. You want to make sure that there's not air flowing, closing those windows. Um, and there's all those things are taught in the training, but you just have to be careful not to get sloppy over time. Thank you, Patricia. Very helpful. 
Um, I think a very common question, and, and I think Katie can help us with this, is the role of pets and, and peritoneal dialysis. I think Katie has a beautiful cat. Um, I do. She's a, she's she's, right there. I don't know if you can see, she's like curled up on the chair there. Um, so I was told that I cannot have the, the animal, because I had a dog, we had a dog in the apartment. Is We had, oh, Lord, we had a kitten that they found in the woods, and then we found, had an 89-pound pit bull. Once again, I was 90 pounds, so reference there. And then we had my cat because we lived in a huge apartment. We live in a huge apartment. And I was told that the animals could not come in at all while I was setting up. But if they didn't mess with the lines at night, that they could sleep in the room. Um, my cat has never bothered the lines. The dog was scared of the machine. The kitten was the problem. The kitten was not allowed in the room whatsoever, and sh my door remained shut while treatment was going on because she would bat at the lines. Um, and I'd never had peritonitis before, and I was not about to get peritonitis from a nasty little kitten. Um, <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> she was half feral. Wasn't going to happen. Um, but like I said, my cat never bothered the lines. Uh, so what I would do is I would make sure everyone was ushered out of my room. I put my mask on, I would scrub down like I was going into surgery, I would clean my exit site, and then I would set up my dialysis. And then once everything was set up and I was connected, I would wait until the initial drain and then the initial fill. And then I would get up and open the door, let the cat in, shut the door, she would go to her chair. And that was that. Thank you, Katie. I, I think that was a great description of all the important things to keep in mind. Um, I'll have Patricia uh, correct me or add, but the main thing would be during connection and disconnection, we don't want any of the pets around. And, and of course, to keep the space very clean and exactly as you described, it, Katie, that was perfect. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, so we just talked about how to prevent infection, which is, you know, potentially the one complication that is there that can be prevented with great care of your peritoneal dialysis. The one other important thing is how to protect your membrane. In other words, how to keep it healthy so you're able to stay on peritoneal dialysis for the longest. Right. That is a common question. How often, how long can a patient stay on peritoneal dialysis? And it, it really depends on each individual. Uh, it's going to depend on a lot of things, how much the uh, urine the, the person makes, um, and also how good and how adherent to the treatment the patient is. Um, the more we eat salt and processed food and, God forbid, allow ourselves to gain a lot of weight, the more dialysis we are going to require. Therefore, you're going to have to give yourself more sugar, glucose exposure, more exchanges. That's how we call it. Over time, that exposure is going to make your membrane tired. And perhaps you won't be able to be on peritoneal dialysis as long as you wish. So I, I strongly recommend to my patients to, to really make the best effort to control salt intake and to control that gain of water fluid, which is going to be pivotal for you to not have to do a lot of dialysis and therefore protect that filter, that membrane on the long, on the long term. Uh, very good. So, so our next question um, is for our patients. Uh, so Katie, what do you wish you knew before you started peritoneal dialysis? Is there something that you just didn't realize that you wish you would have known? Yeah, um, probably the drain pain associated with it. Um, I, unfortunately, my line was placed in a way in my abdomen. I'm, I'm very short to torsoed, long leg, long legged, um, kind of look like a grasshopper. Uh, everyone is like, oh, you're so tall. And I'm like, no, I'm 5'3". My legs just make up 87% of my body mass. <laughs> um, and because of how small my abdomen was, my line kind of laid oddly on a nerve on my pelvis. And so the first few nights, the pain was very, very, very bad. Um, both the initial drain and the initial fill. After that, I was usually fine. And then the final drain would wake me up and would hurt quite badly. Um, they told me that it would pass after a few weeks. They said I'd get used to it. But because of the way the line was playing, it never did. Uh, I did end up just developing a very good pain tolerance to it. Uh, they suggested going back in surgically and moving the line. I told them not to mess with it because I knew the risk of repeated ab abdominal surgeries. Um, I told them not to mess with it. And eventually with time, it did get better. 
Uh, but I do wish that had been something they had prepared me for. Not all patients experience pain. I've noticed in the comments, people have been asking about it. I will say most patients don't experience pain after like the initial treatment. I was just a very odd case because of my, my body stature. Um, but it would have been nice to know <laughs> a little bit ahead of time. <laughs> but I will say now anything can happen to me. And I'm like, oh, well. Like they removed my bladder stent yesterday and I was like, oh, that was a little uncomfortable. <laughs> and then I was like, fine. <laughs> it was more emotionally uncomfortable because I was like, everyone's in this room, like, <laughs> I bet so, so brain pain. I actually asked this question. I, I happened to have my clinic yesterday and, and I asked this question to a few of my patients. And interestingly, that was exactly what they told me. So thank you, Katie, it's giving me uh, more perspective into what to to share with my patients. Um, yes, they were telling me because I, I didn't know how to. It was I had never felt pain like it before, and they asked me to describe it. And one of the nurses was like, "Oh, that sounds like you're having pregnancy contractions." And I was like, "Oh, oh okay." <laughs> yeah, but, and and I was asked, Patricia, but there's a lot, as you said, it, that is not going to happen to all patients. There's a lot of reasons for this pain to be happening. Could be body habitus, like Katie is describing. It could be sometimes position of the catheter that can be fixed. A common one that I needed to make sure we talked about is constipation. Uh, it's our worst enemy on peritoneal dialysis. You want to make sure you're going to the bathroom at least once a day um, because, you know, that can kind of make the flow a little bit slower. It could potentially cause pain. And there's strategies to minimize pain, sometimes even just increasing the, the, the location of the cycler a little bit if that's the type of PD you're doing. Sometimes that, that can help and, and other strategies. Uh, so, Curtis, how about you? Uh, anything you wish you would have known before studying peritoneal dialysis? Uh, well, first of all, uh, that there was peritoneal dialysis, um, you know, uh, it's nice that uh, to hear of uh, people uh, of giving those options and explaining what peritoneal is. So really, it's kind of the education of the whole process of, of doing uh, peritoneal dialysis. Uh, also, uh, kind of like with Katie, there would be times during the night that uh, I would actually be woke up by a lot of uh, some of the cramping that was going on. So. Uh, kind of more about how to adjust uh, uh, your uh, fluids and stuff so that that wasn't going on. And uh, quickly, uh, also just the storage of all the equipment, you know, because uh, we wound up with a bedroom that looked like a mini Costco or Sam's Club. So uh, just handling all of that and as a uh, uh, Patricia was talking about keeping things clean and uh, organized. That's the big thing, too, is just having everything organized. That's great. For this. Um, Patricia, any, anything you would like to add in terms of uh, limitations of space? I, I know it's a common barrier that sometimes we have strategies to help patients overcome if they don't think they have enough space for the supplies. Usually the supplies are delivered monthly, every 28 days. So you're going to need at least a box for each of those days. But we usually do more than that because you have to have choices between the different strengths of solution, depending on if you need to remove more or less fluid. So it's more like 35 to 40 boxes, and it's a lot. Um, so people who have a very small space can have a delivery every two weeks. And it sounds like that would be better, but it's more work because you have to place an order every two weeks as well and keep track of what you need and placing the orders. And um, But that is the other option for people is every two weeks. Thank you, Patricia. I, I will also share that I have some of my patients, again, they live up in the mountain and it's hard for the uh, delivery truck to even get to the patient's home. And, and they have family members that, that have been receiving the supplies and, and eventually help, um, you know, bringing the supplies to patients. So that can also be a strategy um, that can help. So, so we have very good questions from the audience. So, so I'd like to, to answer this question for Yolanda Walton. Uh, she's asking if, if a patient is on peritoneal dialysis and, and the patient has to stay in the hospital 
uh, whether the hospital is going to provide peritoneal dialysis? That's a very good question. Not all hospitals are approved uh, and capable of providing peritoneal dialysis. So if you are to start this type of therapy, your team will tell you which is going to be the hospitals that are going to be capable to, to care for you in the inpatient setting. I, I think this is very important. I always make sure my patients know this. So God forbid if they need to go to the emergency department, if possible, unless it is a life-threatening emergency, of course, we want them to go to the first uh, place they can find. But if possible, you want to go directly to a place that is uh, certified and capable to take care of your peritoneal dialysis. Uh, on the same note, if a patient is going to require rehab, go to a nursing home for a short period of time, that could be sometimes difficult because not all uh, nursing homes in the country are capable of doing peritoneal dialysis. Mm -hmm. Just mention this because it's something that may uh, become um, you know, an issue in your uh, dialysis journey. Um, usually your team is going to be able to find alternatives, hopefully, so you don't have to transition to hemodialysis for that time. But it might sometimes be necessary depending on the location uh, of the country where you are and the resource. So our next question uh, for Ravin or Sharon uh, is asking if, if having a catheter is a problem later for transplantation. Um, also a good question, it is not a problem. So if you are on peritoneal dialysis, Katie had a PD catheter, right? And, and you also, Curtis, when you went to transplant, uh, would you like to answer this question, um, Katie or Curtis? What happened with your PD catheter? You went to your transplant and then what happened? Um, so my surgery took a little longer because my donor had three blood vessels uh, for her kidney. So they had to take an extra hour to connect each blood vessel. Um, so I was under for six hours instead of the original four. And when I woke up, I, I think my first, I, I knew time had passed. And I raised up and the surgeon was standing next to me and he was, he was holding my arm because I was shaking really bad from the adrenaline rush. And I looked down and I said, oh, it's gone. Because he had just went ahead and pulled it out. Um, he told me, he had told me if I'd gotten a deceased donor that he would have left it in for a month. But I guess upon them connecting the kidney, I had, I had quite a bit of residual kidney function left. I, my kidneys function at like an 18%. Um, so immediately I started producing mass amounts of urine. Mm -hmm, um, really and, so, and my creatin went from a seven to a 0. 0.6 within <laughs> three hours. So he, he just, yeah, that yeah, he, he just pulled that thing out. Um, and he knew, cause I, I guess I'd made an offhanded comment about, I was like, oh, the scar is going to be hideous or something like that. So he didn't even staple me. He glued me <laughs> closed. Cause he, and he, he bragged every time I see him now, he goes, Oh, I, I should have been a plastic surgeon. That's not even gonna, that's not even gonna be void over. And so sure enough, like already it's only been a month today makes a month and where they had the line in, it's maybe that big and it's purple from where the blood is like pooled underneath it. But I doubt it's even going to scar. That's great. How about you, Curtis? You, you woke up with a new kidney and without a catheter or? No, no, I wish I had a. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, my surgeon left uh, the catheter in uh, for about a month, and uh, just to make sure that the kidney, even though it was functioning upon transplant, was going to continue. And uh, after they were uh, sure things were going to be okay, they uh, scheduled to have the catheter removed. That's that's great. This actually answers the question better than I would have answered. So you can have the two situations where the kidney is working immediately in the OR, catheter comes out right then. Or when we want to make sure and wait a little bit and the catheter stays with the patient and there's really no problem with that. Sometimes if a person is expected, for example, to have a living donor and need PD for a short period of time, the surgeons may think of placing the peritoneal dialysis catheter on the opposite side of where the kidney usually goes. It doesn't always, but it tends to be placed on the right uh, part of our abdomen. So sometimes the surgeons might just think about that, but that's not necessary. Even if you had it in either side, uh, it should not be a problem for you. So our next question is regarding uh, glucose alternative PD dialysate solution. So the question is regarding something called lycodextrin, uh, which is different than the dianeal 
uh, which is the regular or more common solution patients utilize to do peritoneal dialysis. The question is what things should be considered for incremental peritoneal dialysis if, and if there is any uh, effect, if the alternatives, uh, alcodextrin are more effective than the dionyl. Um, Patricia, would you like to, to, to answer the difference between... Wow, this is... This is a cutting edge question. Very brand new. We just started a patient this month um, who will only use the extraneal. Usually we use extraneal or icodextran um, when people cannot get enough dialysis during the night that they also need a day fill. So it's intended to last a long time, not just a two or four hours. It will last that whole long day from the end of one therapy to the beginning of the next night. But now we started using it for our patients who have a lot of residual function like you did, Katie. When they first start, they will use the manual bag, not the machine, and fill with this icodextran at night and then disconnect. So you're not connected to anything. The fluid is in the belly dwelling all night when they're sleeping and they wake up in the morning and drain it out. Again, disconnect. So that's it, just two exchanges. Um, one to fill, one to drain, and you're done. So it's still new to us, but um, I've heard that it's going to work really well, and we're looking forward to seeing good results. That's, that's great, Patricia. In fact, I, I do have some experience on the same lines, and, and it brings me to a very important patient population, which is the not just the elderly, but patients that might have significant heart problems. Uh, peritoneal dialysis may have a very good role on patients that have weaker hearts. As we mentioned, it's gentle. It's not going to be causing fluctuations in your blood pressure as hemodialysis can. And there's actually a good role for, say, for example, like codextran, this solution. When these patients that have impaired hearts that require a lot of diuretics like Lasix, barely able to control their volume, uh, we've been able to do what we call incremental peritoneal dialysis with, say, one exchange of icodextran, as Patricia mentioned, during the night, sort of complementing, for example, their treatment options. Um, icodextran is maltose, which is a different type of sugar. Uh, one thing to, to keep in mind is if you are a diabetic and you're checking your sugar, the glucometer that you're utilizing to check your sugar needs to be compatible with icodextrin. In other words, you, you want to make sure it's the right one. So it's not misinterpreting the maltose for glucose, you know, and, and your team is going to help you pick the right device. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, but your team will know how to navigate this with you if icodextrin is chosen uh, for your therapy. Um, okay, so the next question um, is, if a patient had gastric bypass in the, say, 10 years ago, is that going to be a problem with the membrane when peritoneal dialysis is to be started? And that's a good question. Um, I would say it would have to be an individual assessment. As I mentioned before, I would not take this as a contraindication just from a concept. I would consult with a surgeon that is going to be qualified and experienced in peritoneal dialysis catheter placements. And I would recommend this is evaluated objectively and you may very well be able to do peritoneal dialysis. Um, another good question, um, if you have sleep apnea and want to do dialysis during the night, how is that going to be affecting your, your treatment? Um, Patricia, any thoughts on this? Patients with sleep apnea um, utilizing CPAP. I have multiple patients on CPAP. So it's just a process when they're hooking up at night, they've got two machines to set up, um, but it hasn't been a problem. I actually had, <laughs> in my clinic in Maryland, I had the husband and wife were both on PD. We had a cycler on either side of the bed. <laughs> I, I have the same experience and I would add something. In fact, there's some evidence that performing dialysis during the nighttime, whether it is peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis in Senate or home, might actually have some benefits for sleep apnea. So, so you actually might consider uh, sleep apnea maybe a reason to consider nocturnal uh, dialysis. Uh, someone is asking, 
Yeah. So someone is asking, um, again, uh, regarding history of abdominal surgeries, in this case, uh, C-section, um, three C-sections with vertical incision, and whether that could be a problem to be eligible for PD. Um, potentially, uh, I would imagine, uh, with my limited knowledge, I'm not a surgeon, that that means that the membrane was significantly caught in the past, but, but I would encourage you to go all the way. If you think PD is something you want to explore, I would request an appointment with the surgeon. And, and sometimes they can actually do uh, laparoscopic exploration, couple tiny incisions, and they're going to be looking objectively into the membrane to evaluate it uh, and make sure um, it's not a contraindication for peritoneal diabetes. Um, one more question from the audience. Uh, they're asking us, on average, if this means anything, how long can the peritoneal membrane last? Patricia, you want to try this one? How long can it last? I, it seems that six to seven years, we start to see problems with the peritoneal membrane not functioning as well. I've had people who last much longer, closer to 10, but if they stay away from the high sugar solutions, that's the ones that tend to last the longest. I completely agree. Um, I've been doing peritoneal dialysis for 11 years. I'll, I'll share with you. I've had patients all the way from having membrane failure within as soon as a year to as long as 11 years. It's the longest uh, one of my patients stayed on peritoneal dialysis. I particularly uh, echo what Patricia said. The, the patients that lasted the longer were very good with their solutions. In other words, they were very mindful of not retaining a lot of fluid, not to get too swollen. Therefore, they were not in need to be using high glucose concentrations. Again, that's what's going to hurt the membrane in the long run. Um, the role of diuretics is very important in peritoneal dialysis. Your doctors are going to be asking you to be very adherent to your water pills. The more you're able to urinate, the least dialysis you're going to require, the longer your membrane is hopefully able to, to last. So that's also a, a good question. Um, our next question, we still have some time. So if anyone, um, they're asking if, if, if the catheter is cumbersome. Uh, this question is for Katie and, and Curtis. Um, was it bothersome? How did you deal with having the catheter hanging in there? How did it affect your your self-esteem and anything you can share with with our audience? Oh, I, I can do this one. I was 19 when they put mine in and I'm a 19 year old girl. So you can imagine how it went over when I'm sitting there and they're like, yeah, you're gonna have this tube coming out of you at 19 years old and a female. I was like, oh, my life is over. I'm some Frankenstein freak monster. Um, it actually was not that bad. I, in fact, I didn't even call it a catheter. I called it my line because it's it's maybe this large in width and it's very soft. Um, I took a piece of gauze and I covered like the uh, where it, it came out because there's no, it quite literally is just an incision and the line is slid in. So there's nothing around it, nothing attached to it. It's not like a stoma or anything like that. So I used to put a piece of gauze over where it came out. I covered that with a Tegraderm water pat, like waterproof patch. And then the line was about this long in total with the actual connection at the end. And I would take the actual connection and I would put it on top of the gauze and everything. And then I would put a piece of tape over it. So it was taped to me. Um, it didn't get snagged on anything. It never showed through my clothes. I could wear what I wanted. And it was positioned right under my rib cage so I could wear high-waisted clothing items without it being bothersome. Most of the time, the line of my underwear would keep the uh, hanging part attached to me. It was not bad at all. In fact, people used to ask if they could see it, like at my college, and I'd be like, sure. And they'd go, oh. They're like, that's not what I was expecting at all. They're like, I was expecting like a chemotherapy port, but no, it, it really wasn't that bad. And I have no scars left from where uh, they put it in. I probably won't have a scar from where they took it out either. So it really wasn't bad at all. Thank you, Katie. That's very helpful. Curtis, anything you want to add? Um, actually, I kind of had the opposite <laughs> or something similar. Um, so it wasn't just that you were 19 or a female. Um, at first, uh, it took me 
uh, uh, really a couple of weeks after the, the placement of the catheter to actually kind of look at that area and really be accepting that I have this catheter sticking out of me. So uh, as I went through the training, I really had a great dialysis nurse who was reassuring that this was not really, you know, anything that big or wasn't going to affect you uh, physically or anything. It's covered most of the time. Uh, so people won't know unless you really either tell them or you're going around, you know, uh, uh, not really taking care of yourself. So uh, uh, after a while, uh, you know, and after I said uh, adopting to having that, uh, it was no bothersome for me. Curtis, I was the same way. Whenever they, they did the initial cleaning, I was like, I'm not looking at it. Uh -huh. I'm not looking at it. <laughs> And then I kind of glanced down. And as soon as I glanced down, I went, oh, that doesn't even look that bad. <laughs> I don't know what I was imagining, but it definitely wasn't that. And my dialysis nurse, he goes, yeah, he goes, I don't understand where you were freaking out. He goes, it's nice big. Yeah. I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you both. That's very helpful. And we're almost done with our session. So I'd like to ask the last question for all of, of all of our panelists. So we can start with Katie, then Curtis, then Patricia. What advice would you offer to someone considering peritoneal dialysis? A final advice. Um, it's, it's very hard coming to terms with it, uh, especially when you have no idea what you're doing um, because people are telling you what it's going to be like and your doctors are telling you that it's, it's going to end up this way and stuff, but you really are kind of left in limbo because when you get the line put in you, you have to wait a few weeks before you even start training and so you're kind of just left in like this darkness. And I think the emotional turmoil is worse than anything else. But once you kind of get over that first, I'd say for me, it was two or three weeks. Once I got over that, over that first two or three weeks of starting treatment and adjusting to, okay, this is something I do every night. I immediately started feeling better once my uremia levels went down and it was like, Despite the pain, despite the emotional turmoil, despite the lo loss of appetite, I would not have had it any other way. And I was so grateful that peritoneal dialysis was offered to me. And I'm grateful that even now, if my transplant were to fail, heaven forbid, it is still an option for me. I did peritoneal dialysis for almost two years. And in those two years, I did not have a single prescription change. Um, so it's different for everyone. But overwhelmingly, I think as long as you adhere to treatment and you look forward, you'll be okay. okay. Any advice for the audience? Uh, just to piggyback off of what Katie said, and she's basically said it all, uh, but educate yourself about uh, PD, about the procedure, uh, about what goes on with yourself, and then adapt it into your life. Uh, like I said, I had a great dialysis nurse who talked about my new normal. Uh, because I was really fighting dialysis uh, from the time it was said. So uh, doing that and adopting it into your lifestyle makes it a lot easier for you to accept and for you to actually get through uh, your sessions and everything and do things the right way, you know, as far as keeping things clean, uh, keeping up with everything, and uh, uh, just making it part of your, your lifestyle. Patricia, any final advice? I would add, and I was listening to this session previous to this one about home hemo, and that don't let people pressure you. If you don't think PD is best for you, you don't have to do that either. There's home hemo, there's in center, and a lot of people really prefer in center. So we're not going to say that that's not a, a good option as well. And some people choose no treatment all of those. And then of course, transplant is our happy ending that we're always hoping for. But there are more options out there. And that is wonderful because, you you know, not everyone has to be PD. If you like PD, it's great for you. And if it's not, that's okay too. Thank, thank you all. I don't have a lot to add. I, I, I echo every single Thing you said, I, I, um, I once again I encourage you to be your own advocate, to work with your team, to ask for your options, to 
to really do a soul search, see what matters to you, what are your values, and try to find a type of dialysis that is going to adjust to, to you, to your lifestyle and what is important to you. So this brings us to the end of our breakout session. Uh, thank you all of our speakers for an informative and very inspiring discussion and to our audience for the great questions you added throughout. Now it's time for the sponsor showcase uh, where you will hear from the companies that helped to make today's events possible and learn about their devices and their educational programs. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, you can go ahead and click on the main stage tab on the left hand side on your screen to navigate to the next part of the program. And we thank you all. Have a good evening. Don't miss that part. It's going to be good. <laughs>